With over 1,500 VO2 max tests completed, and I did an estimate of I think well over seven or 8,000 individual bot lactate samples I've taken, I've spent five years working in this performance lab, doing testing on athletes, breaking down the data and helping them improve. So what I want to do today is break down realistically the key lesson from each of those five years that has helped me improve as a sports scientist, as a practitioner, but mainly the big takeaways across all of that information and looking and observing athlete performance. What have I learned over that time? So without any further ado, let's jump into the five things that I've learned since starting here at the Mets Performance Lab. So it's pretty unbelievable to think that I've been working here for five years as a sports scientist, predominantly working in endurance performance, doing lab testing, etc. And there's a lot that I've learned over that time. So as I said, I'm going to break down really the key lessons from each of those years, starting with the first year, which was back second half of 2017. And I'm going to call it 17, 18, because I actually started middle of the year is when I got things officially sort of kicked off in, in terms of consistently coming into work. Um, and in the October of 2017 is when we actually set ourselves up in this lab here. So um, in terms of what really was going through my mind then was a really individual focus. I was looking very much test by test by test with not only the purpose of helping that individual specifically, obviously that was a really big driver for what I was doing, but largely trying to develop some pattern recognition. That was the main thing I was trying to explore. I'd come out of uni uh, and I actually finished my undergraduate degree uh, at the end of 2017. So come out, I'm now working uh, in the industry for the first time. I'm trying to absorb as much of that practical information as I can, start to see the connections between different athletes, start to see connections between athletes that do very similar training, very similar racing, etc., and really identify the trends because ultimately that's going to give you the clearest insight of, of how people are getting to where, where they are, essentially. Yes, the testing information in the lab is, I guess, an addition to that and provides some objectivity and, um, I guess, some data to to put towards the evidence behind those trends, but having a look at, well, what, what does lab data present like for a 70.3 amateur triathlete who trains in, uh, it trains in a certain way over the course of 10 to 12 hours a week versus one who might train for 15 to 18 hours a week? Um, are there major differences there? What are the things we see from some of the elite, the elite athletes that we might want to replicate with some of our less elite or sub elite, maybe even the amateur athletes as well? what constitutes a really good quality endurance athlete. All of these things I started to really learn as a result of just seeing lots of data and seeing lots of tests. So that's really what I took away from ultimately my first year in the lab. And year two came. So 18 into 2019, my second year, I went full Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, if you're not sure what that means, the Dunning-Kruger effect is effectively this pattern that everyone goes through realistically when it comes to a process of learning. And ultimately, it's just this process where you start off feeling like you don't know anything, you get a little bit of knowledge behind you, which is what I gained from that first year of working in the lab, understanding different patterns, trends. And you think that that little bit of knowledge means that you know almost everything. You feel like you're a bit invincible. You feel like you're an expert already. And I definitely went through that. And that's the major lesson I got out of year two was that, um, in fact, that was the complete opposite. I still didn't know that much. And I was still very, very early. And having that realization of what... Um, what works and what doesn't, I still I still go through some of that process of trial and error, but very much at that point in time, some of the things I was implementing, I felt like it was foolproof, it was gonna work. Some of the training methodology was going to just tick the box and for a large portion it did, but then that's where a few of the failures came and I'll openly admit that I got a few decisions wrong when it came to training strategy or methods for a couple of athletes, which meant that they didn't necessarily perform at their best uh, on race day, which was ultimately on me as a coach and a sports scientist, but partly that was due to, I thought the, the training methodology and the things I was implementing were just going to work, but I didn't fully understand um, why they might not work. And I just sort of believed that, well, if I implement it, that's what the research says, that's what I learned at uni, and that's what I've seen work with a few athletes, that must continue. Ultimately, I found an athlete and multiple athletes where that, didn't, that pattern didn't continue and there wasn't this constant success rate that I'd had so early, which then led into, realistically, year three, which which really started to build a bit of momentum towards me going and doing my master's at the beginning of 2020. So year three is actually 2019 back end leading into 2020. 2019 was one of our most successful years here. What that allowed me to do is actually then have a bit more time, a bit more focus on the athletes in the lab and take the pressure off trying to build a business, so to speak, because we're doing quite well at that point from a company perspective. 
that I could start to really investigate, all right, what did that mean in year two? Why, where, did, where am I going wrong? Where are my blind spots in terms of that learning and knowledge process? And how can I fill those in? And that's where it led to me engaging in my masters at the beginning of 2020, which worked out phenomenally well with when the pandemic kicked in. Because I had one, something to do when we weren't able to have the lab open. But two, it allowed me to focus on going back and learning some more information, building my knowledge base, further understanding physiology and, and the, the backings and the underpinnings of human performance from a physiological perspective and a, perform, a sports performance side of things. How does that relate to in the field, practice, etc.? Let me go and focus on that for a bit, learn some new things, basically become a student again. Because at that point, I'd spent a couple of years out of uni. I'd spent three or four years away from study. So that's where, it's, that's where it was really important to get that in. But what it also meant was because I stepped back into those student shoes, it meant that I started listening first as a primary, uh, again, which I hadn't done since I was at, at uni. I, I sort of came into work and now people are coming to me for information. I'm doing a lot of talking and trying to provide a lot of insight, which was great. But what it made me realize is that I need to sometimes take a step back and listen to what's coming across the table, which for the most part has now led to when an athlete comes and sits across from the desk here before a test, and I've got a couple coming in later today, when we discuss what they're doing in their training, what races they're, uh, they're coming up to, what their current sessions have looked like, what they might have done in the past, etc., cetera, and, and how they're feeling, where they may be finding some difficulty in their training, I can usually get a very good read and almost pinpoint exactly what their testing data is going to show me because I'm taking in that listening side first. I'm, I'm having a really good understanding of where they're coming from, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing first. The testing data is just the objective uh, component to, I guess, confirm some of those ideas or maybe challenge some of that thinking. And, and, and again, if I've created a bit of a concept of what I think that athlete is like and what they're able to do or where we can improve them, we then get the objective data to either back that up or com complement it and sort of warp that thinking a little bit, a little bit nicer so it, it actually gives us the correct answer instead of guessing too much. And largely that's ended up in some much better results for the athletes that I work with because we're getting a much better balance. Pre previous to some of that in year one and year two, I was taking the testing data and like that, that was it. It almost didn't matter what the athlete said in some circumstances. But once I started listening and understanding that, yes, I want to implement things based on the data, but then how do we manipulate that based on what they're telling me to get the absolute best result? That's where I really found a lot of value, particularly when they're programming and coaching athletes to then be able to perform at their best. We could get a blend of what's happening in the science. And I talked about this recently in one of my Coffee Thoughts episodes around the evidence-based approach that I've developed and what I consider an evidence-based approach is this is how it's really come about in my mind is taking in that information and, and being more willing to listen first, then bring the information in, read it, whatever it might be, absorb it, process it, understand it, to then apply an effective strategy off the back end. And that's where things really started picking up from my, what I feel my ability to be an effective uh, effective sports scientist, but more importantly, an effective coach and someone who can write effective training strategies for athletes to be able to improve. So that then brings us into ultimately the pandemic, like 2020, 2021, um, for the most part, like once it hit Australia, it was sort of getting towards the middle of the year. So that's why I kind of block it into this year four side of things. Um, middle to back end of 2020 was almost a write-off in terms of what we could do in the lab here. And 2021 wasn't too much different. We were sort of in and out of lockdowns in Melbourne here. Um, so what it, what it really then taught me was being quite creative. Take all of the information, those trends, the knowledge that you've developed over the last three years prior to that, and let's start to get what I call stupidly practical with... I know for some of these athletes that I've been working with, and it was sort of interesting that most of the athletes that I continued to work with through the pandemic, even though there wasn't much racing and things like that, I'd already got a good amount of information on prior because they'd been with me for the last year or two um, anyway and wanted to continue training and, and trying to find a way to get through this to get to the other side, which a lot of people were trying to do. Or in between lockdowns, we were able to quickly get them in and get some testing done. And what that allowed me to do was take that knowledge and understanding of what, what am I likely to expect from that testing data? Because I've seen so many tests at this point. I was able to get some field testing done remotely, get athletes to send through the data. And I was getting pretty good estimates compared to them when they were able to come back into the lab um, and, and actually test and see the data objectively, which meant that it was a really good way of sort of, again, stepping back and taking away what had been my tool for the for such a long period of time and my, my major tool in the lab testing side of things and going, how can I get very similar results without that? If I had to, if we had to shut down the lab as a result of this pandemic, what, what am I gonna be able to do with my ability to coach and train athletes and, and help improve performance? Well, 
use all of that information I've built as a memory bank of, of how things manipulate. I've seen so much in the lab now. How does that then transfer? Um, but then how can we get to some of those outcomes and insights using some different methodology? So basically, I was going through and developing uh, protocols in terms of field testing that would replicate what we're doing in the lab. Um, where possible, I was trying to get as much information as we could. So that might might have meant uh, heart rate monitors. It might have meant meeting uh, athletes outside within um, open areas to be able to take some blood lactate samples of various intensities. It's having more regular conversations with those athletes, um, getting a bit more communication going back and forth. All of that was a really way, really a way for me to overcome a challenge of my biggest my biggest strength, which had been getting athletes into the lab. And really, my biggest point of difference as a coach in in the Melbourne industry, anyway, was at using some of that objective data and really refined scientific approach, I can't do any of that now. So I have to find a different way of going about things, which challenged my thought processes, but also what it opened my eyes up to was there are some different ways of working here and things like RPE, uh, things like how an athlete feels that I'd learned through not only my undergrad, but also my master's. And I knew through the research was a really powerful tool for monitoring things like intensity and understanding how an athlete feels is very, very closely linked to how they're actually performing um, and what that actually means for them physiologically. It was a good one to force me to revisit some of that information and understand that there's, it's not always about just putting in a refined heart rate range or a power range or putting in exactly what pace they need to run for this effort. It's also considering things like RPE, going out and saying, hey, maybe let's just focus on running at a three to four out of 10 RPE today as, a, as an easy run because pace isn't so much of a concern. Here's a heart rate range I would like you to stick to ideally, but the, the body might dictate otherwise. And really what we're looking for is that nice, easy run anyway. Let's have a blend of both. And and I guess that's where we came to as a result of going through the pandemic was we just had to do it out of, out of a byproduct. And that's definitely informed my philosophy over the next little while, which I guess is the final lesson here in terms of year five, 2021 back end as we started to open up, racing started to come back, um, hadn't really been coaching athletes for races for at that point for a good 18 months with what had been going on with the pandemic and races being cancelled and postponed being able to basically start from scratch and and start to really define my own philosophy i feel like prior to that i had a really good philosophy on training and things like that but it never really felt like i was 100 percent doing exactly what my thought process it was adapted from a number of different other people and and sure that that blend was still becoming a bit personalized, but hadn't really refined into a philosophy that I felt fully. And when I was writing a program or coaching an athlete, like this is, this is a hundred percent like my way of going about things. It, it's an accumulation of, of other styles, etc. But I always felt like I'd, I'd sort of been replicating people a bit too much. Um, and that, that then led to some moments of, Oh, should I really be putting that in and sort of doubting things? Whereas now I'm a lot more confident and defining my own, I guess, philosophy and approach to training strategy um, and methodology implementation really has sort of freed me up to make some better decisions, but also be a lot more comfortable with those decisions and really be confident in the ones I'm making as well, uh, which I've definitely found has absolutely changed how athletes then respond to the training stimulus. It's, it's much even more tailored than I ever thought it was, even though there's some areas where I, I might sort of back off on how much um, specificity I give through the data from a lab testing perspective and maybe lean a bit more on RPE. But largely those decisions are being dictated to by all those things I've said before. It's understanding those trends in the physiology from uh, that overall standpoint. As I mentioned right at the start of this video, I've done well over 1,500 VO2 max tests I've, uh, in terms of I administer those for athletes taken so thousands of blood lactate samples. I've seen so many sets of data and, and gone through those trends and I see these these patterns evolve. Um, but also now I've got that better concept of continuing to push myself to understand more, continuing to listen to athletes as a primary, um, listen to their coaches as well, absorb the information first, then make decisions. That has absolutely benefited the way I go about things uh, overall particularly in this last year and I'm looking forward to continuing to evolve that that doesn't mean that that philosophy is how it stays but it's definitely one that I think that's how I've uh, been able to create some really great outcomes particularly this year um, at the beginning of the year but I'm definitely looking forward to continuing to evolve that as we go into the end of uh, 2022 and ultimately lead ourselves into year six and beyond so that's really been the first five years of my professional practice as a sports scientist and 
realistically five years with Mets Performance here in the Melbourne Lab. Um, looking forward to everything that's ahead. Let me know your questions down below. They're my five key lessons. I, I just want to sort of keep it brief and, and give you an understanding of sort of what I took away and when I reflect back what I've taken away from each of those years that I've been in this lab working in the industry, uh, working with a lot of endurance athletes. Let me know your questions down below around that process. Are you someone who's studying sports science or interested? Are you a coach yourself who might have gone through some of those same lessons along the way? Um, or do you have any questions around what I've done over the past particularly five years, but even longer than that, including what I've done studying why um, internships, things like that as well. Always happy to hear your questions and thoughts uh, down below in the comments, so please leave them there. As always, continue to support the channel by subscribing. I really do appreciate everyone uh, who has helped support this channel in particular over the last couple of years, uh, which has been a big part of uh, what I've then done as well. Uh, everything that I've sort of learned and built has sort of flowed into creating this channel in the first place. So hopefully this video has given you a good little bit of a history um, of not only what you've seen in the last couple of years, but a little bit before that as well. And I guess provide a bit of context to where I'm at uh, from a career perspective in a sports science uh, or a sports scientist uh, sense as a professional. So thanks again for all your support. Hopefully you enjoyed a bit of an insight on this one, something a little bit different today, but we'll look forward to catching you in the next video.